Uh, I think I will have a Sonambula. Sure. Do you have anything less pink? No. <laughs> That's great. This episode of Idea Channel is brought to you by Squarespace. So for this episode of Idea Channel, we're doing something a little bit different. We're at Leenda, which is a bar in Carroll Gardens, Brooklyn, that is co-owned and operated by my longtime friend, Ivy Mix. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you for being here. The thing that I'm super curious about is what containers we put cocktails in right. and why we choose those containers for certain drinks. But before we get started, would you mind telling us a little bit about yourself and the bar? I started bartending like 11 years ago um, during Bennington, mm -hmm. um, where we both went to school. We have a spring term and a fall term, but at Bennington we also had a winter term where we did work in our field. And you went to Guatemala? Guatemala. Yeah. Yeah. So I went there because I wanted to get out of the country, I wanted to learn a foreign language, I wanted to save the children, all the things that people want to do in Latin America. And instead, I walked into a bar and really liked it. Then I racked up a bill there so large over the subsequent two months that I had to start bartending to pay it off. So speaking of getting things together in a glass, okay. I'm sure that there is a practical function for every different kind of glass and that there's also this sort of like artistic meaning that's behind them, what they communicate. Um, but I kind of want to start with what is maybe a dumb question, <laughs> and that is why isn't every cocktail just served in the same glass? You know, I think that frequently that would be best. Because, really? Yeah, because half the times, that I would say more than half, I would say 95% of the times that people are choosing the glass for their cocktail is just mm, that one, you know? <laughs> okay. Sometimes the choice of glassware can be a little daunting. Is it utilitarian? Is it practical? People who make cocktails really should, but frequently don't, yeah. think about how your glassware is going to affect your cocktail. So that is something that we I would love to talk with you at okay. length about. Let's do it. But before we do it, how would you feel about making us some cocktails in, in some glasses? Let's do it. Yes. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> I'm going to start off by making a Sazerac okay. for you. Most people now have heard of a Sazerac, a la Mad Men, a la everything else. The Sazerac traditionally is made in kind of a glass like this, right? Stackable, double rocks glass, kind of all utilitarian purpose. And it's, purpose. Like, it's like, you know, uh, like a quarter of an inch of, of it's, liquid. It's yeah. like this high up. So this cocktail, in my opinion, has always been made in not the right glass. Why are you using a rocks glass? Sazerac you never have with ice. You never have a, ever have with ice, right? This is just a more appropriate glass because it funnels your smell right to your nose, right? So if you go like this, it's going to be, and as you're smelling and sniffing, it's going to all go right here. Just literally, you can see it. It's yeah. like, I'm going this way. As opposed to this one, which like, it just I'm dissipates going that up. way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this one makes it much more appropriate for a cocktail that's all about what you're smelling and not necessarily what you're tasting. Because all of that absinthe, all those lemon oils, aren't really in the drink, it's just what you're smelling. But when you smell something and eat something, it affects the way you taste it. Yeah. I'm gonna make a drink now, which is probably the most iconic drink, the martini. Right now, the martini drink kind of symbolizes the nine ounce martinis, these huge martini glasses that you literally could fit your face into and be like, yum. So that glass is um, precarious. Precarious at best. If you just look at it and it goes like this, which means it's more prone to flip yeah. out of the glass to spill, but no one should drink that much martini. B, um, it gets warm. C, as we discussed just now, the glass itself is just totally impractical and doesn't make any sense. It's not doing anything extra. It's not bringing any it, kind it of like... It's taking away completely, 100% from the drink. So this is definitely not a martini glass. No, this is not a martini glass. This is a glass called a Nick and Nora. Nick and Nora were kind of a popular Hollywood couple, and they were popularized in Hollywood as being socialites. Okay. Pretty much. Like, a little bit more higher class, parties, endless martinis, sure. you know. But back in the 30s, 40s, kind of post-war, people were drinking martinis out of glasses like this. So dainty. So dainty. You think about that time, people had like the, the four martini lunch sure. because they were drinking two ounce martinis. They weren't drinking nine ounce martinis. That's really interesting. Right? So 
This is kind of where we want to be going. The whole Super Size Me cocktail movement is not good. This is very reasonable. Very reasonable. Okay, so the next drink on the list is the Sonambula. Sonambula. Which I said correctly. You did indeed. <laughs> For better or for worse, people have conversations about everything being masculine and feminine. Even the coupe, which this glass goes in, was theoretically modeled after Marie Antoinette's breast. Really? Really. All right. People order a drink and they're like, oh my god. It's like they don't know what it's coming in and then it arrives. And they're and like, it's... oh, it's a pink drink and a, you know, ah, I can't touch it. And I'm like, you know, I think your masculinity can handle it. <laughs> um, the nice thing about a coupe is that it kind of makes it elevated, mm -hmm. no liquid is towards the bottom, it brings it up very high, it makes it a little more fancy. But as far as a, I own a bar and I'm afraid of spending millions of dollars on glassware, maybe not the best coupe, but Look, super beautiful. Looks red. <laughs> yeah, but super beautiful. This drink I'm gonna make is the Boulevardier. Very simple, traditionally made with equal parts, although I'm a drinker, so I put more bourbon in my okay. Boulevardier than I do I'm the other side. It's in that class of, I don't know if this is accurate, but it's in a class of like kind of tough drinks. I would call it a tough drink. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you've got the bitterness, you've got bourbon, you know, tough. Yep. Um, and sweet vermouth. The Old Fashioned, the Negroni, the Boulevardier are drinks that are actually made in the glass. And traditionally, while, whereas like in cocktail culture now, like we don't do them in the glass here um, because I want to put it over that sexy big ice cube. Right, sure. But you can, and traditionally you have, just made them in the glass, stirred it, and made it, which is why the rocks glass is a dual purpose vessel. Say this is like our utilitarian example, right? Like this is like a robust drink. It comes in a rocks glass. I called it a tough drink, yeah. Right, a tough <laughs> drink. Someone's manhood is not gonna be threatened right. by this, you know? It's very like, oh, I can do. Having these things around for that reason, especially as a bar owner, you need to make sure that you have all these options for different people because the worst thing you can do in a bar is threaten someone's comfort yeah. and glassware is a really easy way to give someone a hand in whatever they're drinking. This is amazing. <laughs> so thank you. thank you so much for making all of these cocktails. Mm -hmm. I would love to talk more generally about some of the stuff that we covered, like people's associations with cocktails and how they develop those associations. Some of the cerebral stuff. You have been standing behind the bar for no shortage of time. <laughs> and uh, I think, does your shift start in a couple hours? A little bit, yeah. So we'll give you a chance <laughs> to sit down. Maybe we'll take a seat at a table. All right, let's do it. All right. Well, so first things first. Cheers. Salud. Cheers. Salud. <laughs> mm. It really is great. I wanted to talk about your menu. Yeah. Because you guys did, you did a really specific thing with your menu. Yes. So I was wondering if you could explain what it is and why you did it. The thing that always drives me the most crazy is when people can't handle this drink. So like they get served something that looks like that and then grimace and By it's sulk. I mean men. Okay. In particular are like, oh no. <laughs> you know, and they get really sad and they're like, can you like make this a little less pink and a little more not like that? So we decided at Leyenda to do this kind of, we put the pictures of the glass of, that it comes in next to the drink, hoping that we would bypass some of that awkward conversation that happens. They know what they're getting themselves into. Right. Because of the associations that they have with not just the liquor and the, and the drink and the liquid, but what it comes in. The perceptions that people have of these different containers. Do you have a sense of where those come from? Pop culture is really the only way to put it down. Like, like almost everything else that we go through in our lives, right? There's something about society that has taught us yeah. that this is the way you, you these things are used and by whom. You gotta be kidding, nobody throws a Sazerac. We talked about this a little bit when you were making a martini and we were talking about the, the classic martini glass. Right. I feel like that's such a good case study. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like Sex in the City and <laughs> Cosmopolitans had a big impact on yeah. the attitude towards that glass. Absolutely, that is true. That I think is a big deal why people don't feel comfortable going out and being like, I want that pink drink because it connotates like five ladies going out in the city That's what I'm saying. and like, talking about Mr. Big. <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny because that type of glass has been used for ages and ages and ages. I think it was first seen in an art deco design expo. It was kind of when the martini glass theoretically first had its first 
foray into I'd the world. It, yeah. But the Cosmopolitan is 100% the drink that made cocktails cool again. Really? Absolutely. I think the person who probably made the most popular was Dale DeGroff at the Rainbow Room. That's really what sparked everything again. I'm sure that when he was serving Cosmos, it was indeed in a martini glass, but until Sex and the City made it that social icon, no one had an issue with it until that show. Excuse me? Class, I think, is another aspect of this. Yeah. And I think the martini glass is great at communicating that. But then so is your favorite, the champagne flutes. <laughs> I don't like champagne flutes. I think they're kind of ridiculous. Yeah. Think about where, where in media you see the champagne flute being used, and it's almost always to indicate that someone is fancy yeah. or is having a fan, there's a fancy occasion of some kind. It's celebratory. Yeah, it's celebratory. My sense is that there's a class of people or a type of person who has become either so wealthy or important, they can afford to drink their champagne out of a silly glass. <laughs> so I think this maybe gets to the sort of central question that we're trying to, you know, talk about, which is right. does a drink taste better in the right glass, whatever that means. In order to ever have this conversation now is you'll have to make a cocktail with a glass in mind. I don't think that people have been doing that, but I think it absolutely can be said that there are glasses that make cocktails better. Way, 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 way back, the most skilled and thus highest paid glass blowers were the ones who could blow things the thinnest and the most delicately and they could break like just like that, you know? That was considered to be the best. That's a sign of wealth. It's a sign of all these things, which- you, It's disposable. If it breaks, it's like, oh, it doesn't, you know, yeah, yeah. But you know, everyone's like, oh my God, don't break the thing, you know? <laughs> and if you get something in that glass, it's like, right. yay! So I mean, you know? to a certain degree, that is, it's like the drink does taste better, but weirdly, it has nothing to do with taste. It has to do with you feeling Oh, you know, like I totally. am going to have a great time because I feel fancy holding onto this. Their perceptions are already going into that thing, and that's what glassware does that nothing else can do. Utilitarian, you can make sure. it so it's better yeah. for your nose or whatever, but just aesthetically, what are people seeing? And what are they bringing to? To whatever their perception is bringing to the table, which is why I put this right here. It's great to think about this not as a warning to patrons, but as empowering them totally. with information. In the end of the day, this is the hospitality industry, and you will never succeed if you don't make your clientele feel somewhat safe and okay. Right. You know, if a guy feels uncomfortable with that pink drink, if it's going to ruin his time here, I'm <laughs> certainly not going to make him drink that pink drink in an upcop. But like, don't worry, man, I'll get you a bourbon on the rocks. Like, I got you. If I can get them the right drink and the right glass in the right scenario with the right smile or act, act, attitude, then that is the overall picture that's going to make that drink better than just, you know, some booze in the glass. It's so great. Ivy, thank you so much yeah, for having course. us and for talking to me about this. Yeah. I have learned a bunch. Awesome. And now I'm excited about to drink some cocktails. <laughs> me too. <laughs> so if you guys want to follow Ivy on Instagram or Twitter, you can find her at Ivy Mix. And if you want to follow Leenda, we'll put links to their social media uh, in the description. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ivy. Thank you. All right. High five. Yes. Let us know what you think about cocktails, the vessels they are served in, and their relationship to popular culture in the comments. And I will respond to some of them in next week's comment response video. In this week's comment response video, we talk about your thoughts regarding Jar Jar Binks being a Sith master. If you want to watch that one, you can click right here or find a link in the doobly-doo. A uh, small bit of news, I'm going to be at South by Southwest this weekend in Austin. So if you are there, I will also be there. Uh, say hey if you see me, I guess. I have a panel on uh, Monday morning about uh, the intersection of marketing and fandoms, and then we're doing a PBS Digital Studios host meetup uh, from two to three. So all of those things are in the South by schedule, and we'll also put links in the description for those as well. We have a Facebook and IRC and a subreddit links in the place where the links go, and the tweet of the week comes from 3 o'clock T, who points us towards an article about the naming controversies related to George Lucas's involvement in various Star Wars properties. So we knew about Darth Icky. We knew that that was a joke that we were making, but I did not realize the scope of the problem. There are some, there were some funny names that were in the pipeline. You should check it out. It's very funny. And hey, in case you were wondering, this episode of Idea Channel is supported by Squarespace. If you have a passion that you obsess over, if it keeps you up at night, if you live for it, 
you should show it off. With tools and templates, Squarespace helps you showcase every detail of what drives you. They also offer domains, hosting, and customer support. Because if it's worth the effort, it's worth showing to the world. Start your trial today. Visit squarespace.com forward slash idea channel. And last but certainly not least, this week's episode would not have been possible or good without the hard work of these 1920s New York socialites.